Hello Internet, welcome. Today we are going to write ourselves a little tool. Because we need tools to do some serious work. Tests are passing as they should. I just thought it was hilarious that the, the, the Windows command prompt is actually so incredibly slow that the terminal emulation in Vim is actually faster. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that completely hilarious that, that a for sure complicated terminal emulation inside inside an editor buffer is faster than the native Windows command prompt. That's great. Good software, people, good software. <clears throat> okay, so what is today about? Um, first, I, in the last couple of days, I had some, some very productive time off stream where I made a lot of progress on the JPEG 2 decoder. And as you can see, the JPEG 2 decoder can now completely decode the um, example data stream that is given in standard NXH, which is quite an achievement because despite this image that is pr produced being very small and simple, the stream uses a lot of a lot of the features of JPEG 2, probably much more than your regular JPEG 2 um, scanned document would use. Actually, the conformance data that uh, or oh, oh, one of the conformance data examples that you get with the standard that is a historical fax encoded in JPEG 2 uh, is much much easier a much much sim a much much simpler file than this little data stream and I actually by now I actually also decode this this other test file and I can show you how the result looks like. We should have, so let's go to the debug directory. Yeah. Let's change to a very small font and you will see something. We actually see a fax that has been decoded and I hope you can see it after the the stream goes through all the video processing but this is nothing but the image printed in ASCII characters by my unit test so if I set the console font to something larger you see that this is just ASCII characters encoding in a very very large image and this is all um, decoded by the JPEG2 decoder that we are developing here on the stream. And it's working quite nicely. It's of course very slow currently and we will try to make it faster. But first I want to go back to a little infrastructure work and it's about the following. So let's close that again. <clears throat> I have now set up a C text for me so that I can quickly change, uh, quickly go to the definition of a function. For example, here I see this arithmetic decode bitmap. If I want to go to the defini definition, I just hit my F12 and boom, I'm there. This is powered by C text and, and, the, and the C text integration that Vim provides. And it's just one of these old school tools that just works perfectly out of the box. 
And so I forget one of the most important things. I have some celebratory liquid here. So cheers to old school tools. Ah, tools that actually make work more enjoyable, not less. So about the letter category, one thing that this CTEC integration does not directly provide me and that I would like to have. <coughs> so in my coding style, I have often rather long um, function bodies and there are good reasons for that that I might discuss another time. So here you see, for example, <coughs> the function pass symbol dictionary, which is one of the most complicated that we have so far. Uh, this function has yeah, about 460 lines. <clears throat> and so one little inconvenience I have is that if I search for something, like I am going to all the, the uses of, of a function, I often end up in the middle of a large section of code and I do not know immediately in which function I am in. And so I just want to have the possibility to to learn quickly in which function I'm I'm in, what, what am I looking at? And I googled a bit for solutions to that and there are solutions with Vim plugins. The problem is that the ones I tried, they were just unusable for me because it's, it's the usual modern software experience that you get. The first thing is, yeah, you find you have to combine two tools uh, to do that, okay. So, so far so good. So I download this, or I, I Google those two tools, for example, the, the airline plugin and the uh, tag, what is called, tag bar, I think, plugin. The next thing is that these, these tools again tell you to, to install other software. And this is something that I completely hate. If I want to use your software, why should I be forced to install even other software? And for example, all of these modern plugins, they, the first thing they say is, yeah, we recommend installing us with, uh, by using a plugin manager. I mean, come on people, that, that's complete crap. I do, I do not, I'm not interested in installing a plugin manager just so I can, I can install your garbage software. I mean, why can't you write it in a way that is, does not need any, and that the most funny thing is it does not even need the manager. They just say, yeah, we recommend it, uh, even though it's not even needed. And I could successfully install the plugins just by unpacking a zip, uh, a zip file, which is a much better, better solution than having another software that is a plugin manager that uh, has its own horrors and has to be configured and installed and whatever and kept up to date and would not. So I really dislike this um, this way of thinking about software that is so common today that you have all these little plugins that if they have a good a good day and and they um, they feel like it then they might work together and you need some managers and and to install all of these things and constantly update them and it's just horrors. And then, uh, I mean, all of that I would still accept if the plugins would work well, but they don't. They, they are just much too slow uh, for, for what I want to do. So they, they slow down Vim too much and Vim is actually already not very fast. So. I can actually, if I, if I scroll, I can actually see it building the, building the text in the window, which I don't, I don't really enjoy that, but it's still relatively fast. So for sure you cannot see it on the screen. And as soon as you activate those plugins, they add so much latency that, that for me, the editor becomes unusable, by which I mean it. It, it is no longer enjoyable to use it. So of course I could use it, but I, I would hate it every second of it. And yeah, so um, we have a simple, well-defined problem. So why not do the 
um, the straightforward thing and write ourselves a tool that addresses this problem and is hopefully much lighter weight and uh, much faster um, than what the, the plugins out there provide. At least those that I could find. Maybe there's, there's a, a lean and fast plugin that does exactly what I need, but I couldn't find it so far. Uh, yeah, and okay, <coughs> enough of a rant. Let's, let's get to work. So what I actually want to do is, one option would be to code everything in Vim script, but um, I, first, I don't know Vim script too well. And second is, <coughs> this will likely be just as slow as the other plugins. So I want to write a native tool and call this native tool from Vim. And this native tool <coughs> should be very simple. It should simply be passed the file name of the source file I'm in, <coughs> the line number, and it should print a, sim, a single line description of where I am in the code. And yeah, let's do that. Shouldn't be too hard, should it? Let us change the directory and let us make ourselves a new directory. We need a name. Let's call it, <coughs> where am I? Oh, this is a function, right? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so the first thing is we need to write a program that can load a file that has been specified on the command line. And we will simply load the, <clears throat> we will load the complete file into memory. So for sure we will need some standard IO. We will need the Windows API because we will directly use the um, Windows API functions because I just want to make the tool work right now here for me and be as small as possible and as fast as possible. <clears throat> So we will need some simple argument parsing. Parsing. So let us iterate over the arguments. Actually, let's start with one because the argument number zero is the program name. What I always, always like to do is give my tools a minus minus help option. So let's implement that. So we will need string. So let's actually make ourselves a variable here. Sorry. I'm typing really bad today, badly. So, if this is minus minus help, then maybe we can usually I do only minus minus help, but maybe we should also support some other things that people might write. So in this case, we just print, us, print a usage 
string. So let's use the program name as the first thing and then just say source file name source file name line we can later make a more useful one so the argument will be if this is non null then this otherwise we will just say where am i So for this, I think we probably need a standard library for exit. Actually, let's just, let's just return zero. So in the end, we also return zero. <clears throat> Uh, let's also check against null here. So if somebody is um, pulling our leg and pass passing us null, we will treat it as an error. On the Windows this probably cannot happen, but on the Unix this can happen. So yeah, and then actually I don't think we we need other arguments. If the argument count is less than three. This is definitely an error. Actually, we want exactly three, I think. which is two, um, except for the program name. So we have three arguments. I think actually <clears throat> something something like this we will we will need uh, more often. So let's make ourselves an anonymous namespace of helpers and call this exit error. This is something that we will always need gets a format and some variable arguments. So we need <coughs> standard argument for treating the variable arguments. We need a VA list, a VA start to start the processing of the variable arguments. <coughs> And then we 
will just vf printf the stuff um, exit now we need it because it's not the main function so let's use standard lib so we can simplify this exit error actually the error one we can print this here so we cannot forget this Usage, usage, and then actually, what is the easiest way to do that? The easiest way now is to use a macro here instead of that. Because if it's a macro, we can just do string concatenation in the compiler. So usage and pass the program name. And let's also simplify that. So <clears throat> the program name is, if this is non-zero, then it is this one. Otherwise it is or am I. So this is the prog name. Okay, then we will just have um, <clears throat> the file name will be the argument one, and then we need to parse a line number. Let's actually say 32 in line number is string to unsigned long of this argument and <clears throat> I think this gets an end pointer and if there's some garbage in the argument we get an end pointer <clears throat> that points <coughs> sorry that points to something that is not the end of the string that we pass to it and in this case i can um, give an error expected an end number as the second So now <clears throat> let's just do some debug prints. So we print the file name. We will print the line number. And that's the first, that's the program we will try to test. <clears throat> and let's try to use CMake. I think we will just need to add executable where am I um, I hope this is everything we need 
do we need a pro we probably also need a project something i guess And now let me see <clears throat> in the PDF analyzer, I already have a batch file for running CMake. Um, and let's copy and modify that. Okay, we have an Insta, I mean, that's probably, that's probably overkill, but we need the compilers, the build type, the make program. Yeah, this is all fine. The source. So let's see. Yeah, I have my great terminal back. That is nice. Run CMake. Does it do anything? <clears throat> okay, I'm still looking for setlib. Why is that? Why are we looking for setlib? Did I tell it to look for setlib or is this because of this toolchain file? I mean, anyway, it won't hurt, but. Oh. Ah. I made a mistake that I often make. I modified the wrong file. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, ex I, I exchanged the two files. So let's rename this one to, this is the, this is the one for the, the PDF. Too much Unix here. So I will actually also copy my cleaning batch file here. Yeah, that should be fine. Run CMIC for the debug build. Let's try this. Okay, it no longer should look for setlib. That's looking good. Let's run Ninja. And we have, of course, lots of errors as always. Oh, sorry. It's now called usage. Oh, I didn't finish this. This should just be the problem name and this is this is gone actually. So 
<clears throat> okay, we need standard int. Uh, sooner or later we will probably also need int types. String to answer long <clears throat> does not take two arguments because I misremembered something. What did I? String to answer long. <clears throat> yeah, it takes a base argument. And in this case, we will actually only <clears throat> support decimal. Okay, we have an executable. Where am I? Expected two arguments on the command line. <clears throat> one is not enough. Three is one too many. Two works and we have a parsing of the number. That's nice. Okay, it just truncates the number. That's not so nice, but I think we can live with that for now. Uh, let's put some garbage into the number. Expected the line number is a second one, but God. That is nice. So far it's working. Now we actually need the functionality. So let's make the terminal a bit smaller. Let's also make, copy ourselves the nice um, make the part. <clears throat> I think that should work just as is. Okay, this is set up for different different build configurations. Which actually we should probably do here also. Um, let's make our cleaning a bit more thorough, so we'll um, we clean the PDBs. Okay. OBJ, although they are in the CMake file, so. So. That's nice. Let's make ourselves <clears throat> a debug directory. Where do I always must type? This is just a little batch file that I made for creating the creating the directories for the different builds and creating some shortcuts for switching between them. So we can do D to change to the debug directory, R is release, S is source directory, so that is very handy. One thing that <clears throat> constantly annoys me is that I'm always 
closing the window because I'm not yet um, used very much to this workflow with a terminal window in Wim. I need to find a way to avoid closing my, my editing buffer all the time. <clears throat> and now actually it should work So let's again make our build system. <clears throat> and let us try out if now make is working here. Because then we get the nice quick fix functionality in Vim. Yeah, it's working. So, <clears throat> sorry. My pollen allergy is ruining my my voice today again. Let's actually read the file. And I might I might want to try to actually just memory map it. Or should we just just very simply read it into a memory buffer? It probably won't make that much difference. Probably let's just read it into a buffer. So first we need to find out the file size. get file size x. Okay, for this we actually also already need 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 the file. So let's do that. somewhere so that I can actually see a bit of that next to my window. File name, <coughs> desired access. So we just want to read and we can share the reading. Okay, how do I move the freaking window now when I cannot, ah, I need to grab the thing part here. File share read. You need generic read. Then I think maybe fashion. So security attributes will be null. So this is share mode.
then we have creation disposition. I think here we don't really need anything. We need open existing. Creation this position is that a nice word or not who would have thought that there's something like a creation disposition flags and attributes do we need something there i think as we're just opening it and not creating I don't think we need anything here. I mean, we could use some flags maybe. We could do the no buffering, but this makes things a bit more complicated yeah we can we can we can pass that because we definitely want to do a sequential scan so now I actually wanted to have that here yeah this will be null the template file So return value, we probably have to check against null or invalid handle value, okay. Could not open file and this exit exit windows system error this is something that we actually we actually have something like that already in our pdf parser i just don't know where exactly Where could this be? No, it's one deeper for some reason. I need to remove that extra layer. No, it's not here. Maybe it's is it in PDF parcel windows? We have the fail in the system error. Somewhere I put this. Where did I put this? Maybe in the in test. Test the CPP. Yeah, here it is. Exit Windows System Error and Print Windows System Error. Those are definitely useful. Because it's surprisingly annoying to get to reliably get the error message from Windows and Windows system error and I already have that code here. It 
so let's just put that here and let us make the thing Okay, here we again have the problem with the standard min, so <clears throat> in this case we probably really should use the Windows macro. But okay, we need a sort. Too much work until until we get to the actual actual functionality for sure. But on the other hand, we will have decent error handling, and that's also nice. So let's try it. Let's try the minus minus help. That works. Okay, opening works. Let's give a non existing file. Error, I could not open file, blah, blah, blah. The system cannot find the file specified. Very nice. That is a decent error message. For extra points, we could also include the program name at the beginning. Maybe we will do that later, but okay. So now we can really get serious. Get file size X. I might even have remembered how to call that. So file handle and the, the large integer thing. Exit window system error could not get file size. And let's print the file size for debugging. Um, file size, how is it called? Is it a quad part? And building such a tiny thing takes so long. I hate this. So file size is there. And that's reasonably quick to call. That is nice. So let's just slurp the whole thing into memory. Text is File size. If not text, we're am I allocating buffer for file text size equals So we actually wouldn't even need to free it because this is the program will will die anyway then. So now let's read stuff. And for sure we must pass 300 parameters for reading the thing. Read file. Uh, 
LP number of parts read. Okay, it's not too bad. So, file the buffer, of course. Number of bytes. And no overlapping. Ah, actually, this is a D word. So, this our program will not work if we use this read file function. Our program will not work for huge files, which is probably not such a big problem because. Um, we are working with CPP uh, with, with C source files here, but in order to be clean, we should check this here. So, if file size is larger than U in thirty two max, Parts is not supported. So the D word will be enough. We can cast it here, since we know it's in the range. Exit Windows system error. Could not read file. Okay, so now we should have the whole text in memory. So let's just print it out for debugging. Okay, here we need a quad Part part that's somewhat annoying. Actually, we, yeah, that's stupid. This quad part thing. Actually, let's, let's do this. So we have a reasonable type to work with. Okay. So now we have everything in memory, but I'm getting strange characters in the output. I mean, the file is here, that's fine. Let's see if the beginning also has some strange... No, the beginning is fine. It's just at the end, at the end we have some strange characters.
why is that why do we have sc strange characters at the end because i'm quite sure that our file does not have strange characters at the end let's actually look at our file in a hex editor that i'm just trying out so where was it i am blind ah it's not here it is here so where are we <clears throat> yeah, certainly has not any strange stuff at the end. So, where's the problem? Ah, the next thing is we should check this. So, if n bytes red is not equal to file size, then we have some kind of problem. Okay, that's not the problem. We definitely get, we get all the bytes we expect. So let's see. Um, let's do some debugging text plus file size minus 10 compile time is so long for such a little thing <clears throat> fd so actually this should be unsigned character here it's fd the FD sounds familiar because I think. Ah, I know what the problem is. I know what the problem is. The FD is something that the debug runtime puts at the end of every memory buffer that we allocate. And the problem is that we don't have a terminating zero here. Because we would have actually, we would have had to allocate one byte more here. We would have to have allocated one byte more here. Uh, 
and after reading we would have had to supply a terminating zero Yeah, that's the problem. <clears throat> and so we had we were reading past the end of the buffer and we saw this this FD value that the debug runtime puts there. Yeah, now it's fine. Now it is fine. Stupid mistake. Fixed. Okay, and now let's do something actually useful with, th with this data that we have quickly slurped into our memory. We will not work with binary, binary files here, so we can do the following. We can now rely on this terminating zero. Let's make ourselves a running pointer. And let's <clears throat> read the whole file. The first thing we will need to do is depending on the character. So if we have a new line, we definitely will need some special handling because we will um, need to determine a line number. Um, actually, I already... Um, Let's call this the query line. <clears throat> Let's call it the query line. So we can call this here just the line. We will start at one as line numbers do, strangely enough. Very old fashioned. So if we have a new line, we will increment the line number. That's the first thing. So what, what else do we want to do? We definitely, because my idea is the more complicated thing we could do is that we could do some actual lexing of the C or C++ code and really understand the tokens and so on. But I think for now I want to make something much simpler. I want to I want to look at the indentation because I practically always have consistent indentation and I, I want to build a kind of stack structure that lists the, that, that lists, um, so a stack that keeps the previous lines that have less indentation than the current one. probably with the exception of, of preprocessor lines. So if devs and so on, we do not want to track here. So this will need some special handling. So we will need something like a column that we reset upon new line. Uh, tab will need a bit of special handling. 
I, I usually don't have tabs, but let's say we do have tabs and let's treat them as eight for now because I mean we could make a command line option for it later, but I think I really don't care too much. But I, I want to treat them reasonably at least. So a tab has the effect of increasing the column to the next multiple of the tab size. So a tab does something like, first it increments the column by one, let's say, and then it goes to the next multiple of the tab size. So basically we will we will round it up right okay. top size minus one divided by top size something like this. So if we have let's say if we have zero that which is the, at the beginning, so we count columns from zero. Then this gets one, then we have one plus top size minus one. This is top size, so this becomes one. So we are at top size. That's fine. Let's say we are already at, we already had seven characters and then we get the top. So here we are at eight. Eight plus seven is 15 divided by eight is one. No, sorry. 7, 8, 8 plus 7 is 15, yeah, divided by 8 is 1, and then we are at 8, yeah, that's fine, that's actually fine. Okay, so we have the top handling. For everything else, we will increment column by 1. So that's the column number handling. Uh, the next thing is we want to find the first non-space character. So let's let's also handle space especially here. So for space we will just increase the column number. Okay, so if we actually, I think if you're here, we don't really need to, if we are here, we are at the first non-white space. I mean, actually there is some, there is some other white space that we could be dealing with. So, The R character we will simply ignore. Because then our tool works with Unix and DOS file endings. So. For for other strange characters, we might actually want to issue a warning. So if we have something like a form feed or, or anything. Um, so let's say if character is, is less than the ASCII space.
Uh, actually, let's let's do it like the usual compiler style. File and line at the beginning. So U and A T character. Okay, so we'll. Um, we were born about strange and non printable characters. <clears throat> so here we know we are at the first non indentation character of a line. Uh, let's for now just do a debug print. Let's print our column number and the rest of the line which we still need to find first we need to find the rest of the of the line so let's also print line number And so the line starts starts at the previous because we already consumed this here, so we need to subtract one. Uh, we will then, we will now scan, we, we will actually scan ourselves for the first, for the end of the line. So while pointer is not null and while pointer is not the new line and pointer is not not the um, carriage return we will increment pointer And then we will so well let's say line ends at end of file is true if if not if if we don't have a null at pointer. Uh, if we have a null at pointer, then we know that the line ends at the end of file. We will now also create an artificial terminating null here. And restore it later. And that will be our first debug print. So now we should see all the lines with their indentation column. Yeah, that seems to work. So let's take a closer look. We have all the lines here with four, four indent four, indent eight, indent 12, indent 16. And already we should be able to see stuff like function declarations have, yeah, this is at level four, for, and then we have the function body at level eight, 12, and so on. Yeah. 
And what we later will want to do is if we are at the level 12, for example, we will, we will want to look at, 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 the, at the previous level 8, at the previous level 4. And we will need to be smart enough, for example, if, if the previous level 4 only has a brace, we look at the line above and so on. So we will also want to have some kind of structure of backlinks to backlinks to the previous indentation levels. And for that, we might actually want to count the lines first. Maybe we should do that as the first thing to just count the number of lines in the file quickly. Because that will be a very fast operation. So let's count the number of lines in the file. So we will actually start at one because we will consider that the file always has at least one, one line. So this way we get a conservative count because I mean we could have in we could have an empty non new line terminated line at the end but um, And this makes it possible for us now we can we can allocate a structure. So let's say line info. We will keep this very simple. We could be smarter about that to allocate only the stack that we need and so on, but uh, the, the line line context stack, I mean, but we will do it much simpler. We will just allocate the whole array. And for every line, we will store indentation and we will store a pointer to we will store a pointer to the previous line that has the first the nearest previous line that has um, less indentation. 
the nearest preceding line with less indentation. Another point uh, if it is the line with the least indentation so far. So let's malloc a huge struct of these. I mean, this is all small data for a modern computer, right? So it's, um, let's actually put the pointer first. Or let's make this, we could make this more compact by, by making this an index. That's more compact. Exit error and compact is cache friendly. So exit error. I mean, this will not be not the most cache friendly data structure because we will not, it will be rather sparse. We won't need a lot of the stuff in between probably. Again, we wouldn't really, we wouldn't re really need to free, but it's just a habit of mine to to do it as well as setting the pointers to zero, which is just a good habit to have. It's not needed here. Okay, so we have our line info thing. Let's see if we still build. We might have a redeclaration error. No, not even that. So, oh, another thing that we, uh, another thing that we want to keep here is. Offset of the first non indentation character from the beginning of the file. Uh, this is probably something we would like to store here also. So let's fill the line infrastructure. We just point to the first one. And the first one we actually can, we can already fill, right? Because the outer index will be zero. The indentation, I mean, the indentation we don't really know yet, but it doesn't hurt to set it to zero. I mean, actually, we don't know these things really yet, except for the outer index. <clears throat> so we could also only set them later. Because these, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it's just if a line, <coughs> sorry, I have again, I.
let me just quickly get something to help with my allergy and <clears throat> I will be back soon. Are we back with some audio?
Okay. So, what do we need to do? We have this indentation detection figured out. So, once we know that, we will actually fill the line infrastructure. So, we will fill in the indentation. We will fill in the start offset, which is pointer minus text uh, minus one, because we can also use the line text here. It's maybe less confusing because then we don't need the minus one. So. Uh, whenever we increase the column, uh, sorry, whenever we increase the line, we will also increase the line info pointer. We could actually look this always up by the line index, but yeah, whatever. So we will fill that out. Um, Next thing we do want, want to do is to have this outer, this outer index. And actually we do want to set here also the indentation first first to zero so we do have the guarantee that line info so let's write this here we um, line infos outer index dot indentation shall always be initialized this is an um, this is a invariant that we do want to have Okay, and then, so how do we actually want to handle that? Any time the, the indentation increases, Uh, let's try it this way. We have a previous indentation variable. So we set the stuff here and And if, if the line is indented more deeply than 
the previous one the previous line becomes our outer becomes our outer scope con or indentation context so then then the outer index then becomes the index of the previous line so minus one because the line numbers are one based not zero based and another minus one because we want to have the previous one Um, okay, here we actually should, we shouldn't do that in the first line. I'm not sure about the quickest way to do this. Anyway, let's let's move the debug printing to the end for now. So here we print um, the line number let's actually call it an index because the line number is actually one based so we put print a line number we print the indentation Uh, we will print the line itself but we will also so we will print the outer index Yeah, so this will be one plus index, so that's the line number. Then we print line info outer index plus one. Well, let's say one plus that is the line that is the outer context. Then we will print the indentation and then we will print text plus. plus line info uh, start offset. So
so that would be a debug printer. Um, here, actually, what I want to do here is for the non-empty lines. So actually, these are the non-empty lines because the empty ones, the empty ones will actually be completely handled here. Mm. Which means for the empty line, what do we do for the empty lines? I think for the empty lines, we will give them the previous indentation. the previous outer index and maybe Yeah, start offset and we will replace the new line by a null. Place by now, other, otherwise ignore. So we we'll also replace this one by now. Okay, so we should get valid data also for the empty lines because this now will only handle the empty line. So this is a um, white space only line let's say and here here we have nulled out the first the first of the terminating characters now the trouble is we could have another one if we have a multi-character new line sequence and we should we should distinguish that from a So let's not restore the old character for now. Um, so let's say if the old character was a courage return. And so then we know that point of one is a valid character to look at. If this is a new line, then we have the MS DOS new line R backslash R backslash N. then we will actually say we will also also 
also replace this and skip it. Actually, skipping we will do here. So point point points to zero. So normally we point at that what the old character was. So if the old character was not null. And we have this one. We replace this one and then we actually need to increment another one. So if old character is non-null, then we definitely are not yet at the end and we want to skip we want to skip i hope that is correct this probably should be cleaned up a bit but okay now we are skipping so, so the non-white space line is completely handled here now. So we will need to do a bit more work here because we will need to also increment the line info. I think we should do this like this, right? So increment and then fill it out and then increment the line info pointer. And we actually will also need the to reset the column and increment the line. This is now not so nice that we have this two times. Uh, this we actually already have set here, right? The start offset is also already set. Uh, the outer index. Okay, so this is another thing um, we also need to handle going back out. But let's not do that yet. I think this, let's do that in any case to set this line in for auto index. So this is also set. So here we just need this. Yeah, let's see if this does something useful. Okay. We can definitely cast this because we made sure that the file is not larger than four gigabytes. Same thing here. Wow, already crash. <laughs> so, what do we have here so far? So it runs through and probably crashes at the first empty line or something. So we have line one has outer of line one, zero indentation. That so far, this is all correct. But then then we crash 
and I would guess it is due to the first non-empty line creating some invalid data. Yeah, this is the this is the wrong way around here. So <laughs> of course <laughs> we are pointing into oblivion. Yeah, better. Now it crashes at the end. Because at the end probably yeah, we the last one is probably not filled out. The last one So if we have something filled out, then the last one is not filled out. So we could do it like this, that we align info end, that we remember the one we remember the one past the last one that we filled out. This should actually be it should actually be one at most one one less than the conservative line count that we have. So let's print end lines and end lines line infos field. So the first is just end lines and the second one is line info and minus line infos. And let's reset n lines to that. Okay, we still have some problem here, but let's let's first look at whether our output makes any sense so far. So, this is the first indented line. It is line 15 and we say the outer context is 14, which, which is exactly right because that's the, that's the anonymous namespace, 14. Okay, this points to 15 because it's at the same level. Should this not actually okay, it's at the same at the same level. I mean, at the same level, it's questionable whether we actually want to increment or not. Let's see. Um, I actually wonder. why this is why is this incrementing so we have line with 8 16 this points to this one okay this so far i can 
understand this, but Here would also expect to see 14, pointing to 14. Because the outer context should only be incre incremented when we actually see the indentation changing in a positive sense. Why is that? It should always point to something with less indentation. But we do set the previous indentation, yeah. do set previous indentation. Let's print more stuff. And crash. But that's so far not the problem. What we're looking at is this one for line 16. So here, why is this zero? Why is this still, this is always zero? Why? The previous indentation is the break before. So why is does this not reached? Ah, ah, sorry, <laughs> stupid me. That's the problem. We reset the column before assigning it. That's not right. Yeah, yeah, crash away, crash away. I want to see how stuff looks like now. So, yeah, this is better. We have this pointing to this one that is farther out. We have this pointing to 16, which is the latest one that has strictly less, strictly less indentation. That's fine. Or these are all 16s. Okay, here we go in one more, and we point to 23. That is fine. And then, of course, as soon as we get less, things will no longer work because we do not yet do the walking back. So now we must do the, the walking back on the stack. So we have the case that this line is indented less than the previous one. <clears throat> actually, actually, 
we should have an invariant, right? That previous indentation should be the same as the indentation So we probably can, if this is true, then we should probably get get rid of previous indentation because it's redundant. So the line is indented, indented less. So let's assert this here again, this invariant, so we make sure we understand our own code. So we should, we should walk back So we walk back while column is smaller than previous indentation. And this should, should, And we also walk back only as long as outer index is not zero because we could hit uh, the first entry and then we do not want to get, go any further because otherwise we would be in a, in a non-terminating loop because this index would point back to itself. And the only case in which this should show, so this should never point back to itself, except in the case of the very first line, right? So, this should always be strictly less than the auto index. Let's see if this works. Okay, we fail. Actually, we don't understand our code because we fail this indentation. In line 16, column is for previous indentation is for and let's also print the outer index and the indentation of the outer index So outer index is 13 with indentation 0. Ah, okay. The previous indentation is, this, is actually for the previous line and not for the previous context. So 
it's actually for the previous context. It's actually for the previous line, not for the previous context. So, so the second one here is for the previous context, and this can actually be smaller than the previous indentation. So that's actually not... Okay, and now we get the funny... Because these can be different, the previous indentation can still be larger cannot be smaller, right? Cannot be smaller than the the context indentation. Because if it would be smaller, it would actually be in an earlier context, right? But now we have the funny situation. So if previous indentation is strictly larger than the context indentation, then our own indentation can be in between the two. So if we have something like, like this, then this and then this. So this would be this would be our outer context. Then we are here. The previous indentation is now smaller. But it's still strictly larger than this. So this becomes the new context and shall nest back so shall chain back to this one So if it is the same as this one, it shall actually replace this one. That's complicated. I don't know why I find this complicated to think about. It shouldn't be really complicated. Okay, because then we can still get this thing here. In the end, we always want the previous indentation to get this at column or below column. If it is below column, we actually want to do this and become and become a new context ourselves for the following lines.
I actually need to look at Okay, we still have some invalid assertions somewhere. I did not save. So maybe we have we do it wrong here anyway. So this is all fine, this point is back to... First one, space, so... And this line has this one as a context, that is fine. Set the outer context to the previous line. We get back to eight and then we point to we point to sixteen, which is actually fine. That is actually fine. So we always have here the same association. We are in the same function at the same level. Okay, we close here. This does now this does not go further back. Because why sixteen is a four. This should now actually go back, go back to the namespace because sixteen. Line 16 is at 4. So I think we actually, if we hit, if we hit one that is at the same level, we want to go further back. It's just
because if we hit the same level again, we actually want to point back to the to the one before. It's just we don't want this to happen if we so only if the indentation changes we want to do any of that yeah this is now this is really not not clean this because my bad understanding is reflected in the bad structure of the code as we see it. I don't know why I'm today not, not clearly formulating these things. So we still have the problem here that we, we have some invalid data at the end. Let's look at something. Yeah, we fill exactly one less. And 246 we still fill. And it's still printed. The N lines is two, four, six. Yeah. That looks actually fine. So let's see if our data structure looks reasonable or not. So inside the format call, we then we are back at 8, pointing back to 16. That is fine. As soon as we go back to 4, we point back to 14. That is also fine. We go to 8, we point to 43. That's fine. 4, we point back to 14. Zero, we go back to one. The sixty-six, eight, uh, and four, we go back to sixty-six. This it, it seems to work now. This is this is fine. That is actually fine so far. So let's first let's just find out why we crash at the end. Let's do it in a debugger. Oh, actually, uh, I would have to set up a project for this. Bruh. I don't want to do that, no. Actually, that would be a nice, a nice opportunity to, to try out remedy remedy debugger 
just to know if it has does it have a does it have a trial version or something like that Okay, I mean, sooner or later I will definitely get it, I think. I don't want to buy it now on the screen. Um, so let's find out what is going on the old-fashioned way. First, let's see, do we get here? at all. Yeah, we get here. So is it, are we messing up the heap are we just messing up the heap no that's not the problem We are definitely screwing up something badly. Which of course always happens when you're streaming. That's the fun of it, right? I mean, we could try to debug, but let's see what happens. If this works without a project file, NTDLL. Lambda, we, we are inside some lambdas. Are you kidding me? CRT guarded core. Execute on exit table. Wow. Crazy stuff here. But I guess this is just I guess this is a consequence of us damaging the heap somewhere here so let's first assert that our line info pointer is valid
whenever we use it. Where are we messing up things? Ah, oh, by the way, that reminds me after reading the text. We could actually right away close the file handle. I mean, this also happens when the process terminates, but So why do I not see the problem here? Does it have to do something with, with our skipping here? Actually, equalness would be still okay because we have the terminating zero. Uh, this one shouldn't be here, right? Because this we already did before. People, why are we crashing? That is so embarrassing. Let's do nothing at all. Well, we're not crashing. At least that's sane. Let's for now not do these, these debug prints. Yeah, again crashing. Then 
Okay, what is the next? The next thing that could be problem I mean, it could be that this loop is somehow out of control. But on the other hand, we should only ever decrease the auto index, this loop, and it stops when the auto index reaches zero. So that should not be the problem, but so let's at least check that we have a valid index. I mean, it could be some of this trickery that we do here with replacing stuff. I'm for sure missing something quite obvious here. Nobody's screaming in the chat. Oh, ah, because now we have too many new lines in this thing. I mean, we could do we could do some more simple skipping here. So some very simple skipping that should be should be safe. Okay, we crash again. People are really don't get it. What is going on here? Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm so stupid. Of course, we are completely messing up memory. This is crazy.
Yeah, that's it, of course. Stupid, stupid. Yeah, this is in my in my actual productive code base. This can no longer happen so easily because I have much nicer way to allocate arrays. Well, you don't, you cannot, you cannot easily forget this stuff. That's one reason not to use malloc directly because it's easy to forget that. So let's restore this stuff. This we do no longer need. This we can restore. Um, we will restore this skipping stuff, although we probably can make it simpler now. So here we skip, we, sk we skip until we see an n r o zero. If we see an R, if we see an R, we skip it and replace it with a zero. Same here. So then we do not need so this is too this stuff is too complicated this we don't need we don't need the old character i think line ends at end of file we probably also don't need this really and this is much simpler now r n Yeah, I like that much better already. Yeah. Better. Better, better. So, let's clean this up a bit. Skip to end of line and replace line terminating characters with null if, if there are any. That is fine. So here we still have this ugly loop that we could formulate much more clearly probably. Uh, this is fine. So the rest of the stuff here is mostly fine. I think this loop I'm not really happy with. This is a bit too non-obvious why this works this way. So let's create one or two test files. So let's say we have a namespace foo. And then we have, let's say, we have some not so nice indentation here. So we also want to do something mostly reasonable with that.
9, this goes back to 1, that is fine. Uh, 9 goes back to 1, that is fine. 5 goes back to 1, which is actually fine, yes. Command 9 goes back to 5, 5 goes back to 1, 5 to 1. That is all correct. Great, so I think... Oh no, not this again. Not this again. I think we can actually go to the final step of producing some interesting context information. Let's first do it in the in the most simple way. So let's not print this here, this new line we will print here. Okay, now set this. And then what we do now is we walk, we walk back. So let's do let's walk up a step. If this did not reduce the indentation, So first is the indentation should always be less than or equal the previous indentation if we walk out. If it is equal, this should only happen if we are already um, I think this should only happen if we are at the very outermost context. Okay, and now we will now we will print a simple context line. Okay, we don't we don't break 
out of the loop here so we print we print all of the time the same because I didn't auto auto index because we actually did not set the previous indentation yeah. So we have no reasonable thing to compare against. <clears throat> Let's say struct is in namespace foo, this is namespace foo, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, but the comment nine goes to five. The comment should actually be first in the comment should actually report this one here nine goes to five. Oh, no. the, the, those names are much too similar. I thought about this before and now it shows they are too similar. We will fix that. Yeah, now we have the comment is in the braces stuff. Okay, because now we, we do not have yet the smarts to go back to to, to climb up to a meaningful context here and this is in the namespace and that is fine okay this is starting to look not yet useful but but this is getting somewhere functionally so now we could test some some smart stuff here so we go here to the outer level we actually went back up a le level and now we can try to be smart about skipping uninteresting lines so if So let's say while outer is actually not the first element of the array and and as long as you are at the same level of indentation and um, line is um, I will save it line is not interesting well line is let's say line is boring line is boring text a line is boring and let's give it let's give it the author and the text and we will make ourselves here the helper line is boring so now we actually need the line info up there uh, 
let's first do a very very line text text plus line info start offset And let's say the let's do the most simple thing first. Let's say the line is boring if it's just a if it is just an opening brace. So it looks more interesting. We have the information that the comment is inside void bus and this is again inside namespace foo. Yeah. Uh, that is already something that is a bit useful. So let's do something more here so we have a comment and let's make a if condition as blah blue so the blah is inside the if condition The blue is inside the else, which is, yeah, this is not so interesting, of course. It's not as interesting as an if. Let's put things in a loop. Yeah, for an else, for example, we could we could of course be so smart that we that we actually look up backwards to find the if that belongs to the else, and somehow format this here. But I mean that's nice these for later. So let's say the. The four is inside the bus. Yeah, this is this is starting to look useful. Now, one thing I might one thing I might want is that I actually have this in the other order. So we might actually want to do a kind of reversal here. Should we just do it dynamically allocated or should we count how many levels we have? Is it, use, is it useful for us to know the number of levels? So first, let's change one thing that 
the line infos we will change to line info array to make it less error prone okay yeah let's let's maybe count the levels It's just here we have this mm. the special case is not so nice that we have this At the beginning of the file, we have this outermost scope that refers back to itself. So let's say while while outer is greater than the line info array so while it is not this very first it's not this very first one So we have one, even if it is the outermost one. And whenever we have a link, from something that is not, from something that is not the outermost one to another one, then we have one context more. So here we actually count, we count the outermost one even though it is actually not interesting at all. Hmm. Actually, somehow the whole the whole data structure gets ugly because of this. this looping back to itself of this outermost context. As we use indices, we cannot, we cannot easily use a null pointer there. I mean, we could use something like u int max or something to mark this non-context situation if 
Should we do something like that? Let's try. Let's try that because this is. I mean, this is really making everything ugly that we have this. This zero here. I mean, we could just make this minus one. We just would need to check here that lines, if n lines, if this is leaving, leaving the signed, the signed range. Now let's say if it, yeah. Yeah, these are theoretical limits that we won't reach. So we actually can make the auto index something signed and we can, that makes it much more elegant. We can check against the negative. So index of the nearest preceding line with, with less indentation or uh, no such line. I think that the, I mean, we would have to do the check, but I hope that apart from that, um, do we need that because auto index is invalid anyway? So I think we do not need to set that here. We just explain that we have an invariant. If auto index is valid otherwise we don't care so this is fine this will get to minus one at the beginning auto index is now a d So, we set the auto index here. If this is strictly larger, while auto index.
This is still true because we go down to minus one. Okay, here the previous indentation we need to be careful. Because we can go back to the no context situation. So we count the number of contacts, that's the first thing here. So not forget this thing again. We actually start with the Okay, this we don't need because we do this inside. And this should not always be strictly less. We do no longer have this case. I think this can remain the same. Okay, and here we will actually just fill in the context. So. Maybe we also want to give some line number or something. Just an index, which is line number minus one. Give it something like this. Context array.
more very simple loop and uh, Let's see if this works. We have made some mistakes. Sign unsigned mismatch. Yeah, that's true. But we know that this we can safely close that auto undeclared identifier. Hmm. Why? We do declare it here. This must be caused by some syntax error earlier. Yeah. That's the problem. Possible loss. Not really. So how does this look like? Oh, the, the error is going the wrong direction now, but uh, the blah is in void bus in four in errors. Yeah, that's now. The only thing is we are doing one too little because we don't have the, we don't have the namespace now outside. One goes to one. Five. Okay, five goes to zero. That, that's not. That's not right. It should actually five should actually go to one. So nine goes to one. And that's fine. And five goes, yeah, this is because of our screwed up indentation here. So here it goes back too far. Because this is, now we have this, this case that this is smaller than the previous indentation, but it's still, it's still strictly larger than, than this one. So we should actually only go back to this one. So we should actually keep the context of this. That's the that's the the one I was thinking of. So column Is less than or equal, which actually means here it is actually strictly less in the first iteration.
And here actually we should only do this assignment Actually, we should only walk back if if this is if the outer index is too too far indented for us. then we should move outward. Yeah, now we have the namespace again. We just have the wrong, the, the, the arrows are pointing in the wrong way. Yeah, this is getting somewhere. So I think this is relatively close to being useful. So let's do a bit of cleanup and then create some useful output. So this is fine. The error exits are all fine. Let's see if this documentation is index of the nearest preceding line. We have strictly less indentation. And that's fine. It's also fine. So yeah, we won't look at the argument parsing. This is okay, this can go, this is just debug. Uh, we should maybe, maybe should, we should close the file as soon as possible. Would this be nice? Um, Close handle, I guess, right. Close handle. So we don't need this print. So we read everything, we slurp it in, and then we close here also. File. Yeah. 
yeah, whatever. And let's set it to null so we don't accidentally use it. Okay, yeah, this, I mean, this we, we could maybe make this more exact. Right now we count the number of new lines plus one. We count the number of new lines plus one. So if if the last character of the file is a new line we count one line too much because it actually terminates the line so we could do we could reduce the count or also the other way we could count the number of new lines and if the last yeah let's do it like this so let's count the number of new lines and if the very last byte in the file is not a new line then we have an extra line because we have at least one character after the after the new line that means we have one line more So, why space only line? And I think that is all fine. Um, yeah, if we have if we have an R N in a white space only line, so we have R, we replace it. And then we come here, so everything is fine. Because it's empty anyway. So we don't really care what the start of it is, as long as, it, as it's pointing to a terminating zero, which it is. Um, Type spaces, that is fine. Okay, here we warn, but we don't do anything special. So we Cannot, I think we cannot really so easily get rid of previous indentation. This is a bit ugly for the special case for the, for the first line because previous indentation could be could be meaningless
<clears throat> yeah, I think it's just we have to deal with one special case here. Maybe we can make this a bit clearer if we say if the indentation decreased, we will do this. As if it increased and we are not in the very first line because then the increment is not really meaningful. Uh, because previous indentation was not really meaningful. It cannot, de this cannot hit in the first line because we initialized previous indentation to zero. <clears throat> yeah, this is, I think it's now reasonably clean, this part of the code. Um, so this uh, switch. Yeah, it's not a great beauty, but this can be now, I think this can be simplified now because now we should actually know exactly how many lines we have. Uh, so let's actually assert here that this is equal. And let's get rid of this line info and okay, we shadow the line info here, which is not so nice. So I think this stuff should be in its own scope because that's really its own thing. It should probably become um, a function anyway, but I care so much about it, but it definitely should be its own scope. Um, almost, so nothing that it, no, none of its local variables should leak outside. And here, of course, I mean, we do a lot of work here for every line, which actually we, we only need to, to do the work for one line, which we will soon do. So um, this will come faster. So it is still working. We will, will be, we will need to be smart about shortening the line. This is, will be the last thing that we will do. Okay, so this is looking quite good already. So let's change here from I think I might actually want to keep this possibility of looping over everything. We can probably make this a make this a command line switch or something. Um,
So let's maybe keep the loop because I think for, for trying out new stuff it could be very useful. But let's let's focus on the query line. Ah, actually, the query line, the query line must not be zero. I mean, we could we could say that query line zero means print all of them, right? That's maybe a good idea. We could maybe Um, line number for which to print where my information zero means print all. This is something we could do. Um, Query line, yeah. If query line is non zero, then the begin index will be query line minus one, and the end index will be query line. Otherwise, the begin, sorry. Next will be zero and the end index will be the number of lines. And then we have here the begin index and the end index. So now we can we should be able to query a single line. So let's query line 10. Yeah, we only get line 10 and if we say zero, we get all of them. And let's say if yeah we we make a more verbose print if query line is zero because that's our development mode. So let's see which let's query for blah. So that is line nine. It's a namespace foo in function bus. Yeah, in if condition that is looking good. Um, the n lines debug print we can remove now. This one. Yeah. So now we only have one line of output. And that is actually already, I mean, we, we, for sure, we will need more, more smartness. Because we do have things like, if we look at our real life, real world code, so, I mean, we have simple things like this where we, where we only need to get from the praise here, but then we have definitely for functions with lots of um, for such functions um, here we will definitely need to skip from the praise 
to the next line with the same indent. Okay, but that's actually not too hard. We could say if this line is not interesting, skip to earlier ones, but only consider those that have the same indent. That's something we could do. Because currently, let's see if we if we currently would would do line seven one one four here. Let's try that. Seven one one four. Um Yeah, we even get this one, it seems. So maybe let's let's do another thing for now. Let's print, let's actually print the line numbers here. So we can e more easily find out what's going on. So we, we go back. Yeah, so this, this macro stuff we, we will need to exclude anyway. Then there's also line continuation. That is another topic that we should we should handle line continuation probably. Where we already get more into actually tokenizing the thing. But here we go to 7106 because I think we do not except going back we, we we only go back if the indentation is Yeah, we should here actually even if the indentation of the previous line is greater, we should still go upwards. It's just we shouldn't stop we shouldn't stop at the line. So we're specifically looking for this indentation. So if we have a previous line and the previous indentation is not less, or no, actually, If it is exactly that and it is boring, then we should skip no if it's not the first line and if 
if it is boring. Then then we should skip so then we should definitely skip this one but then we should keep we should keep moving over the more indented lines And then we we would check again if the if the one we found is boring. Let's try that. Yeah, that is much better. We get the decode text region. So the next thing is the macro stuff. So I don't think I want preprocessor lines showing up here, preprocessor directives at all. So we we need to special case. So we always see only the first non-white space character here in this case because the other ones are handled below. So what do we do if we hit a preprocessor? directive we should somehow we should mark this line as being no candidate for interesting no candidate for interesting context so this line should never become a context line. So say it is true at the beginning, whenever we start a new line, this is not so nice that we have this in two places where we start new lines. If we see this as the first non-white space, we say this line may not become a context line, whatever happens later. And whatever happens later will... Actually here we will fall through, because this is already the first non-white space. So no problem with setting that, I guess. Yeah, this is an invariant that should be true anyway, but we will not do any of this stuff. So only if this may become a context line, because this is where we actually make the previous line a context line. And this happens because of this previous indentation thing. So we must be careful not to mess up the previous indentation because I mean the previous SSL lines, they are somehow out of band with the normal indentation. So we just put them in the same context, which might or might, might not make sense. We skip all of this. Um,
and only if so we only said we only modify the previous indentation if this is a viable context line candidate Wow, this is looking so much nicer now. Look at that. We are in a function, the code text region that is inside the namespace text that is inside the namespace JPEG2. That is exactly what is the case. That is, that is exactly the case. This is becoming useful information people. Maybe we should make this more compact like this. I'm not sure about the, the separators. Let's try something like this. Yeah. This is starting to look look like something we can use. We can of course do many things like for example shortening shortening keywords like namespace or omitting them omitting the namespace uh, the namespace keyword at all it would probably make sense. But this is this is now looks quite fast. Um, let's go to seven thousand. What is that? Okay, here we have some comment stuff that's not looking so nice. That is might that might be a problem without a proper tokenization. Six nine nine eight. Okay, that's actually the line itself. Okay, why here? We seem to be are we here off by one somehow? Six five twenty because the namespace control that would make perfect sense. I mean, that's not the bad thing that it shows this here. Let's check if we have 7003, segment collection, collection add segment. Yeah, we get it. Yeah, we, we, the shortening will be another topic, but this definitely works. No, I mean, it also has the same problem with the control with the control space. So let's let's put all of them and print print it to a log file. Two eight six, okay. What, what is going on at two eight six? This is triggering. We are walking the contexts. We are walking the contexts and we get the problem that the outer. Yeah, we need some debug prints here.
Ugly. Yeah, of course. I should do some flushing. And print some new lines. Fifteen six two, fifteen six one. Okay, this has something to do with the preprocessor stuff. Points to fifteen six one. Um, line fifteen six two points to line fifteen six one, which is not right. Ah, uh, I know what the problem is because do I know? We, we retroactively made this because this this kept the previous indentation of this one and then we retroactively made this the context So we actually must remember, we must remember the latest line that can become, the latest line that can become a context. Good that we had this assertion, it found a real problem. So let's see, we have this may become context. Previous. Previous valid index. So a white space only line also cannot become itself, it cannot become a context for anything. So we do not set this previous valid index. We only set it here if we had a if we had if we had a line that could potentially become um, become an interesting line, then 
we set this previous value index to the index of this line. which is line minus one is the index. And then here, when we say here, this is actually the previous, previous valid index that becomes the context now. Let's see if that uh, still does not fix the assertion. That's a bummer. But we have a different problem now. Again, something pre process three, five, three, eight, two, six. Okay. Yeah, we might have the line continuation problem thing going on here. I definitely don't have macros that are long enough that I need this functionality to work inside a multi-line macro. So probably we should learn we should learn to deal with line continuations to some degree. That might be the problem here, but I'm not sure. It actually is. The, so it points to three, five, three, two. That is the namespace. Let's see if, yeah, that's actually reasonable. That is actually reasonable. Ah, but of course, okay. So here we are, we are actually detecting inconsistent indentation, but as we said, yeah, those, those macro lines are not required to have, they are not required to have consistent indentation with the rest of the code. So how do we check this? Yeah, maybe we should not check this at all. Let's mark this. Um, cannot really assert this as lines are outside the consistent notation scheme. Let's think about that later. But the line continuation stuff is something that might need to be done. Okay, now we make it through without hitting an assertion failure. Okay. 
Okay, this goes back to the namespace and then inside the macro we have some some kind of nesting going on, which is maybe not the worst thing, but probably does not make too much sense. Let's see if we get a meaningful log file now. Yes. Uh, which was the one that didn't work before? I think it was around 7000, right? Names with controller. This looks better now. Six nine and eight namespace control. Yeah. Now it finds the correct namespace control. That is not too bad. Mm -hmm. I think we have something that might start to work. So let's actually make a, a mapping from from Vim to call this stuff and print it somehow in our echo line or in our message message buffer line or however it's called. So Here I still have these horrible <laughs> experiments with these Swim plugins that I did not like at all. So I guess let's let's make a function. A script local function. And let's call it where am I? How do we write? Uh, actually, need some parentheses. So now I must write some Vim script, and I really don't know Vim script too well. I mean, what what we can definitely do is we can make a let's say a script wherever where where am I been and point this to our binary. No, that's actually in Sigrin home. Let's for now just use the debug build. Uh, where am I? Okay, if I just would know something about Vim script. Um, no, no, no. Help functions. Oh, yeah, there's this thing with channels, but it seems too involved, I think, for what we want to do. Is there something like a system string output of shell command filter? That sounds good. System. System is system is I think what we want to have. So 
system. I'm not even sure how to make a local variable here, but so let's make it script local for, for now. So, is system where am I bin dot then we need the file name and the line um, help functions How do you get? This is for sure really easy. Okay, expand. I think expand could work. Okay, execute is another thing. Execute. Execute. Oh no, this is an X command. That's not the right thing. We need system. Let's look at expand current file name. Yeah, that's it. Current file name is the percent and line number. So it's going to be line. What is the current line number? <clears throat> okay, buff number line num get cur pos get pos. We want something like this get pos get the position. See line line which is line of the fire position. Okay, line is good. Line the cursor position. That that is what we want, I think. So here we want an expand. Uh, this is the current file name and the line at the current pos uh, point of position. Uh, let's first. Let's first just assemble this string and echo it. So we see that uh, so we will now would call call. Oh, I cannot call this if it is local like this so I need a mapping do I use in the mapping I'm never sure how how does this work for the mapping of the Uh, 
I'm not sure if you can, can you do it? Can you map? Can you map? Okay, I'm a bit confused what is the right way to do here. So we actually we want to call this function. Yeah, this worked. So it writes Okay, that doesn't look too bad. So let's go to a nice file and let's do this. Hey, we got something. We are in namespace Citrix namespace impl decode SSCC ITT line. Okay, it is already working and it's fast, it's instant. And we only pay the price when we really use it. That's the great thing. So not for the time when the screen is updated. We are in while x not equal columns, is this correct? Yeah, this is perfectly correct. Here we are even deeper, we are in the if. That is so nice. I mean, the user interface with the Vim integration and so on could definitely be improved, but and the shortening and so on. So a lot of things to shorten here, obviously, but this is, this is really working, people, it is working. We made a programmer's tool. We made a programmer's tool that is working. And as you see, the, the file is already quite large that I'm working on here. So over 7,000 lines. I might even soon split the file. But the problem is the compile time. So if you it's really a question if it pays to have more compilation units. I mean, back in the day, this this actually gave you compilation speed because make could be smart and not rebuild the stuff that didn't change. But nowadays you have headers that modify everything because there's so much stuff in the headers and you have to rebuild almost everything every time anyway. 
and the compile times are so large per file that um, the probably larger compilation units give you a better, a better trade-off. We are in inflate data stream fetch. Is this correct? Yeah, this is absolutely correct. And now the nice thing is the following. So if I for example, what I often do is I just look where is this used in the file with the star command. So <clears throat> often in the code bitmap, where is this used? And then I jump here and I don't know exactly where I am, and I press F1 and I see I'm in past generic region. That makes a lot of sense. And here I'm in Pulse Pattern Dictionary, which also makes a lot of sense. Nice. And I think, I mean, this is so fast, this is so fast that you could even do something like if if you can if I can make it so it's um, displayed in a single line without uh, causing this prompt, then it's so fast that one could automate it to do it after every search command, for example. So um, whenever I use the star command, I could get some, some location information down there. It is working great. Very nice. Where are we? We are in arithmetic decode. Where are we? We are in arithmetic decode bitmap and in some loops and stuff. not too bad and not and what i especially like it's not displayed all the time so i know that there are some editors and maybe even i don't know if you can do it with win plugins but there are editors that have these vertical stripes where they display scopes like this and so on and i don't really i i think i wouldn't really want it Okay, that that works nicely and it's instantaneously fast. Probably it takes Vim longer to redraw the screen than it takes this program to scan through the whole file and find out. And we haven't even optimized anything and it's the deeper good also and so on. So. Okay, that's an, I think that's a nice success for today. I mean, I spent a bit more time on it than I thought I would. I was not in my best reasoning shape for some of the, <laughs> some of the stuff. Maybe it still needs some cleanup. But we have something working. And and it's nice. So the next round will again be something productive, I guess. So one thing that definitely needs some addressing is the speed of the decoder. It's horribly slow, which is no wonder, especially if you look at, at JBIG2, it's basically made in a way that almost dooms it to be slow. But it's for sure slower than necessary currently. And um, So here we have, I mean, that the text output is slowed down mostly by the console, so the, the program actually is much faster. But, but here we see 
I'm parsing some of the example files that you get with the standard and the one with arithmetic decoding in debug build it takes almost a second to almost a second to parse this file and this is uh, way too much yeah in the Huffman decoding is is much faster so this takes about 70 milliseconds but yeah it's still a lot of time for just a single page of course this is this is debug so we could look at what the release build does and I know it's definitely faster but it's not that fast either wow oh, this compile time this compile time is so crazy yeah stupid warnings I need to get rid of F open is so dangerous don't use it Yeah, you see definitely much faster. So maybe four times faster than the debug build. Here, here maybe a bit more than two times faster. But still an order of magnitude difference between the Huffman coding and the arithmetic coding. I mean, this, this will not really go away because the Huffman decoding like we do it now is quite fast. I mean, it's not not blazingly fast but it's it's not too shabby for for code that hardly has been hardly has been really optimized <coughs> but uh, arithmetic decoding yeah, is definitely very very slow <coughs> yeah that's one of the next things to look at and now we got some orientation in the code because let's go somewhere where are we we are in namespace jbig namespace arithmetic arithmetic integer decode perfect okay so thanks for watching and Hope to see you again. Until next time. Bye.